So first of all, I uh, just want to say thank you to the National Academies for organizing this incredible event. It's been a great couple of days. Uh, I've just been so inspired by so many of my colleagues uh, who come up here. And I'd also like to give them the opportunity, or, or thank them for the opportunity to come and talk about this idea, which interestingly enough was born for me in the experience of, um, of the America's Climate Choices uh, panel that was done here at the National Academy a couple years ago. I served on the Informing Decisions in Action uh, uh, panel. And this was an idea that really kind of was born in that experience. We talked to people in the federal government, in private sector, in, in civil society, uh, academics, uh, the media, and so on, trying to get an idea of what did, kind of information did people need and how were people communicating. And what became very clear in the course of that is that there were a lot of people communicating, but they didn't really know how to do it. And they were really hungry to know how can we do this better. So this. Uh, proposal comes out of that experience. Okay, another uh, question is, so first of all, why might we need a national partnership for climate communication? Well, here's at least a few more additional reasons. And now this is drawing from our national survey work, uh, by the way, so I conduct national surveys, have for about a decade looking at how Americans respond to climate change. And so here I'm just going to give you a couple quick data points, um, if this works. Okay. Is global warming happening? So John showed a, uh, Karazdink yesterday showed a, a version of this, but this is another one where we basically compiled all the different uh, long-term survey questions from a variety of different uh, survey uh, researchers that have asked one variant or another of this question. And as you can see, they get different kinds of answers because they ask different kinds of questions, but that's not actually what I want you to look at. What I want you to look at is that they all show the same basic pattern. That from 2007, which was kind of a high water mark in the United States for public understanding that global warming is in fact happening, that we saw substantial drops uh, on the order of 15, sometimes even more percent down to 2010. Uh, they've come up a little bit since then, uh, but not back up to where we were back here. Okay, but we can take that you know, into other key questions. Do you think it is mostly caused by human activities or natural changes? We also saw a significant drop there. This data, by the way, is from just a couple months ago in 2012. Perceived scientific agreement, this has been talked about several times, but just another uh, underscoring the point, only about a third of Americans correctly understand that most scientists think it is happening. This is not, is it human cause? This is not, is it a serious problem? This is just simply, is the world warming? And only about a third get the correct answer here. 41% uh, still believe, still perceive that there's a lot of disagreement among scientists. And levels of worry. That worry levels dropped as well in this time period. But note that even back in the high water mark of 2007, only about 17% of Americans said that they were very worried about this issue. Now why is that? Well, one of the main reasons, and this has been consistent with our research for over a decade, is that for many Americans, climate change is a distant problem. Distant in time and distant in space. Okay? Meaning that the impacts won't be felt for a generation or more, and that we're talking about polar bears or small island countries in the Pacific Ocean, uh, not the United States, not my state, not my community, not me or my friends and family or the people and places that I care about. And so it's seen as psychologically distant. Dr. Kahneman talked about this yesterday. That, and as it's psychologically distant, we don't worry about it that much. We also don't make it much of a national priority. OK, well, we have another way of getting at this question. And this actually draws, uh, it was so great to see uh, Dr. Kahneman's uh, speech yesterday, because uh, he was describing system one, or what we often call experiential processing. This has been an area of our research for uh, just over a decade. And what I'm going to share with you is uh, how we ask this question. It's basically to, it's a form of free association uh, that we uh, conduct in all of our national studies. And since we have a sample of the American public, we all get to play along. So the question that we ask Americans is this. What's the first thought or image that comes to your mind when you hear the word global warming? Now, please don't say anything. Now, just out of curiosity, please raise your hand if you had something pop in your head about melting ice. Sea ice on the, on the Arctic Ocean, ice shelves off of Antarctica, melting glaciers on the world. High up high, please. Wave them. Oh, yeah, look at that. Works every time. Okay. <laughs> now, this date is from 2003. I'll come to more recent data in a moment. 
Um, and that's what we find, is that many Americans see, uh, start immediately thinking about uh, ice melting around the world, and in part that's because it's one of the few ways that we have to visualize this issue. This is abstract, it's invisible, okay? It's very difficult to portray this on television, okay? But melting ice is something that you can visualize nicely. In fact, one of their favorite things to do is calving glaciers. I mean, what great TV that is, you know? Big, giant chunks of ice falling off a glacier and uh, falling into the, into the uh, water with a giant roar. That's great television. Well, they rely on that image a lot, and it's gotten through. Okay, but there's a problem here. All right, all those people are thinking of melting ice. Hands way up high again, please. Okay, now keep them up if you live in Antarctica on the shores of the Arctic Ocean or next to a melting glacier. <laughs> okay, it reinforces the sense that this is distant. This is something that's happening at the poles or at the highest elevations, okay? Not where we live, not in our own backyards. Okay, other important things that we've learned from this, a whole variety of things, I'm not gonna talk about them here. Confusion with the ozone hole, that's a very consistent problem. Uh, apocalyptic images of what global warming will bring. Uh, and then last but not least, what we call naysayer images. <coughs> These are people who have different reasons for doubting or dismissing the entire idea of climate change including a few that we would lovingly call conspiracy theorists. They'll say things like it's a hoax, uh, it's scientists making up data, it's the United Nations trying to take away American sovereignty, it's Al Gore and his friends trying to get rich, and various variants of, of those kinds of arguments. Okay, one other thing I want to emphasize in relation to what Matt Nisbet said earlier, one of the most interesting things that we see in this is what we don't ever find, never, in all the years we've been doing this, nobody associates climate change with impacts on human health. Zero. Okay, where are we as of uh, just a couple years ago? We've seen a pretty remarkable shift in some of these first top of mind associations to this issue, okay? And about half of these, that's obviously the big shift, about half of those are now conspiracy type images. Okay? So what's going on here? Well, there's a whole host of factors. We're talking about an incredibly rich and complex and dynamic social, uh, social system. So there's a lot of things, I think, that have gone into play. It's kind of been a perfect storm, uh, including the economic crisis, uh, declining media coverage, increasing political polarization and identity politics, political opinion leader cues, scientific scandals like ClimateGate, and a vocal, well-organized, and funded opposition movement. But at the same time, the climate communication community itself has not been as effective as it could or should be. There are lots of organizations communicating. We've been doing an inventory and we find hundreds, thousands of individuals out there who are trying to communicate this issue. But they often don't understand their target audiences, who they are, what they know or think they know, how they currently perceive the issue, whom they trust, where they get their information, what their underlying values are, and how different people are predisposed to interpret and act on information in different ways. Okay. Too many organizations are still relying on simplistic information deficit model of communication. Alternatively, others are still relying on very crude fear appeals, which basically scare the crap out of people and that's gonna engage them. Um, and far too much one-way communication, as we also heard about from Tom Dietz. Moreover, by default, I'd argue that the climate community has essentially adopted a let a thousand flowers bloom approach, with many organizations out there trying to do it uh, themselves, winging it, I think, as we heard. Um, by contrast, the climate change dismissives are relatively organized, they're focused, they stick to their messages, and they're pretty effective at communicating them to the audiences that are most predisposed to listen to them. And in the end, the differences between these two organizational efforts or it's kind of like the difference between an incandescent light bulb, which I'm not using by accident, and a laser. Same amount of energy, totally different result. And in this case, we're the dim bulbs. <laughs> okay, so to meet these challenges, I'm proposing that we create a national partnership for climate communication. And first of all, let me just say, I think it's critical that the goals of this have to be decided collaboratively. This is not for anybody to suggest. So what I'm gonna say here is just my own uh, personal uh, suggestions. First of all, I think the overall goal should be to inform and engage Americans in climate science and solutions. That shouldn't be too controversial. Um, but we also know that Americans don't need 
all the details of climate science. And in fact, I would challenge the community to think instead, what if there were only four or five spaces in people's heads for critical information about climate change? What five pieces of information would you want them to know? Okay. I think in many cases, that's what you've got to work with. So I would say, and this is also based on work that John Croslink has done, we've done, a lot of our other colleagues, here's at least five proposed ideas. One, global warming is happening. Two, that it's mostly human cause this time. That unchecked, it's going to have serious consequences for humans and nature. Four, nearly all climate experts agree on points one, two, and three, as Ed talked about earlier. And last, that global warming is solvable, that there are lots of valuable ideas on the table. Importantly, I don't think this organization, this particular partnership, should be about advocacy. Okay? I think that undermines the basic uh, scientific ideas, and it also gets all the potential partners throwing rocks at each other because they don't like each other's uh, approaches. So I think this probably should be a national effort, should be strictly nonpartisan, should be diverse, should include government, private sector, academia, formal and informal education, and NGOs. Uh, should be a learning organization, much like what we've all been talking about over the past couple of days with rigorous research, teaching, evaluation woven into the DNA of the project itself. Scale what works and abandon what doesn't. And crucially, that there needs to be this shared investment in the development of a common knowledge base produced by these interdisciplinary research teams of climate, decision, and communication scientists. And not last, but certainly not least, you've got to build and strengthen this network of networks through a regular series of conferences, workshops, and capacity building. Now, the good news is that there's many of these pieces are already in place. For example, there's widespread and growing recognition of the vital need for effective climate communications across all sectors, and I'll say from lots of different scales. I'm hearing this conversation happening at the local level, at the national level, and I'm now having this conversation at the global scale, okay? With other major partners, uh, other major nations, like China. There's already a growing number of social scientists who are focusing on this problem, and they are already building the, the shared knowledge base. We already know a lot. There's a lot to be done, but we already know a lot. And a number of new networks have already begun to form. Um, to try to support and improve uh, climate communications. However, most are still focused on particular sectors. A group on the business community, another on, say, the scientific community, another with the faith community. But I think the critical thing now is to pull all these disparate pieces together into a coherent whole. We need the loom um, that one of the science advisors talked about earlier today. So what if we adopted some ambitious targets? This is trying to be very provocative. What if we said that by 2017, we moved, that we were able to help on Americans understand, 84% of Americans understand that climate change is happening compared to what it is today? What if we could get 60% of Americans to understand that it's human cause as opposed to 46% today? What if by working together, we could get half the country to understand that most scientists agree about this? What if we put our efforts together across all these different communication uh, organizations and united our voice to get some simple, clear messages through? So last thing to say. So imagine with me for just a moment that it's now the year 2017, exactly five years from today, and that by working together, we've helped to catalyze a national shift in the social, cultural, and political climate of climate change in the United States, where most Americans now understand and accept just a few key scientific facts about the issue. Imagine that Republicans and Democrats are no longer arguing about whether global warming is real or human-caused, but instead are arguing over who's got the best approach to solve it. Does that seem hard to imagine? Perhaps. But remember, it happened just two years ago in the United Kingdom, where conservative party leader David Cameron beat labor in part on the promise that he and the conservatives would do a better job of solving climate change uh, than labor. 
Okay? In fact, he pledged at the time that the conservative government would be the greenest government ever. Will it be easy in the United States? No, of course not. For all the psychological, cultural, and political uh, complexities that we've explored over the past couple of days. But can and must it be done? I say yes. And if you say yes too, then what are we waiting for? Thank you. <laughs>